morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath. All right. Get your mic on, awesome Pastor. Lord. Amen. Pastor, right. your mic on. How's that? A little loud. Try it again. All right, that sounds better. He likes it when I cooperate with him, that, that audio-visual guy up there. <laughs> um, I have a broken computer, so I am borrowing my wife's computer today, which is why you saw a little extra commotion up here with Randy helping me get situated. So uh, anyway, I'm thankful for both my wife letting me use it and for Randy knowing how to get me tied in. Anyway, um, pleased to be with you here this morning and just thankful for the blessings of the Lord. Um, I don't know what has been mentioned as, as I only arrived a few minutes ago. Um, I do want to take the opportunity to mention to you all that uh, we want to keep... Um, Kareen in prayer um, and her family. Um, they are very much desirous of your prayers, though they do not want visitors at this time. Um, and, you know, it, it seems imminent. Um, so just pray for the Lord's presence and blessing on, on both Corrine and, and the whole family, will you please? In fact, could we pause for a brief word of prayer right now? Father, I, I want to thank you because I know that we have an audience with you right now. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful that you know the things that we have need of before we ever lift up our voice. And I pray, Lord, that today... Corrine and all of her family will experience your presence and the peace that comes from your abiding presence. I pray also, Lord, that your holy angels will dwell there ministering to each one of them. And we don't understand your ways and your timing, Lord, but we do know that you have Corrine's best interest in your heart. And that you know what is the right timing and the right way and all of that. So we want to commit her into your care. And just ask you to bless her and, and, and do according to your good and perfect will, Lord. And I also just pray that um, the entire family will be encouraged by, by her faith and, and by their faith. Recognizing that you are faithful. So bless them all to this end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, this morning, I have entitled the message, What is Blocking Your Blessings? What's Blocking Your Blessings? Now, before we get into two narratives, because we're going to look at two biblical passages, two narratives that address... Um, the, uh, a couple of things that will impede on the flow of God's blessings into your life. Okay, now what we're doing is we're beginning a three-part series today. We're going to deal with two of the things that impede God, the flow of God's blessings into your life in today's narratives. I, I want to start out by... Um, sharing with you a brief story from my childhood. When I was five years old, I lived in Mount Morris, Michigan. And in the summertime, it was, it was hot there. Uh, not like the biggest heat of summer here. But some days, and I'm, the day I'm telling you about, it was a really hot day. It was in the 90s, and I was about five years old. And my brother and I, we would always play out in the backyard in the summertime. My mom would hook up a sprinkler or maybe a slip and slide or something like that. Or other times, we would just play with the hose. Okay? And so on this particular day, 
it was one of those days where we were just playing with the hose. And, and then we, we shut it off and we were playing on our swing set. And it got really, really hot. And I went over to get a drink from the hose. So when I got over to get my drink from the hose, I had the hose here and, and the faucet here. And I turned it on and the water was just barely dribbling out. So I turned it on full blast and it was still just barely dribbling out. So I put the thing in my mouth like a five-year-old does. And then my brother over here released the kink that he was holding in the hose. <laughs> and it, you know, you know, my cheeks swelled up and water shot everywhere and I was choking, right? So it was, it was blocking the flow of water into my mouth. And today, um, what I want to talk about is what might block the flow of God's blessing into your life, okay? And we're going to look at two things from two stories today. So if you brought your Bible today, could you say amen? amen? Very good. Let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 9. The Gospel of Mark chapter 9. And we're going to read this passage of 15 verses here. Um, Mark chapter 9. When you're there, would you please say amen? amen? All right, very good. We're going to begin reading in verse 14. Okay, so picking up in verse 14 of Mark chapter 9. And it says, And when he, that being Jesus, came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. What does mute mean? All right, quiet, can't talk, that's right. Okay, and where, wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him, he being the demon, has thrown him, the son, both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. I'm going to pause for just a minute. So I, the Bible doesn't say how old this kid is, but I'm picturing maybe he's a teenager. Jesus asked him, how long has this been going on? He says, from childhood, right? And what happens to this kid is he's got a demon in him. And the kind of thing that happens when, when this demon takes over is he throws him on the ground. The kid becomes rigid, starts gnashing his teeth and foaming at the mouth. And he, he actually does this. He throws him into the fire. So the dad has to rescue him out of the fire. He, they might be walking beside the river and he throws him in the river. And now he's stiff and rigid. And the dad has to dive in and save him. That's the kind of thing that's going on since he was a child. So now let's pick up where we left off, which was verse what? 22. Thank you very much. But now, now the father is still speaking and he says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of that child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, 
I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he asked, excuse me, and when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And that is where we're going to stop with this first um, situation that causes, that causes a block in the flow of blessings. So first of all, we're going to take a, a closer look at some verses. Let's look back at the text. Let's look at verses 17 and 18. Look at verse 17. Then one in the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Notice that in verse 17, at the, at the or, pardon me, at, in verse uh, 18, at the end of the verse, he says, um, I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Right? So now he's saying, I brought you my son. Now, one thing that I want to point out here, folks, this is something that I hope you will remember for the rest of your life, no matter who you are. Whatever your issue is, whatever your concern, your trial is, you can bring it directly to Jesus. You bring it to Jesus. You know, he went to first to the disciples, didn't he? And listen, the disciples, these are, it makes sense why they went to the disciples. These guys were, you know, Jesus' disciples. They're walking with him. They're talking with him. They're learning from him. These guys work miracles too, don't they? Right? Yeah. So it makes sense that they went to the disciples, given that. But... But it makes more sense that they would go directly to Jesus. So here's the thing. The disciples, unwittingly, they kind of were, they were kind of like my brother, crimping the hose. The blessing of God was not flowing through them into the life, was it? Hmm. But Jesus is the one that you all need to go to. We all need to go to. Directly, right? Now listen, it, does that not mean, I mean, God works through people, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah, sometimes God uses a person to speak truth into your life, to encourage you, to provide for you, to protect you. God uses people. There's no doubt about it. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to someone who you respect as a spiritual leader to ask for help or something like that. What I am saying is don't do that before you have gone to Jesus. Go to Jesus directly. Go to Jesus personally. Go to Jesus with whatever it is that you need. He came with his son, didn't he? What is it that you want to bring to Jesus. Come to him directly. You know, this is something that I really love about the stories that are in the Bible, okay? A, a couple of things. Number one is these stories are about people who are flawed, like you and me, okay? And secondly, there are lessons from these stories that we can draw out and apply to our lives today, right? So I really appreciate that. So the, the first part is go directly to God. Remember that for the rest of your life. Sure, you can go to other spiritual leaders for help. I'm not discouraging that. I'm saying first things first. Make sure that you have your personal connection with Jesus and you're going to him. Not trying to just connect with God through someone else. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Now let's look at verse 22. Verse 22 in the narrative, the dad is speaking and he says, 
And often he has thrown him into both the fire and into the water to destroy him. But what? If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything, if you can do anything, who is he talking to? He is talking to, remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? All things were created for Him and by Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. Isn't that right? We are talking about the one who speaks things into existence. We're talking about the one who called Lazarus forth from the grave. We're talking, if you can do anything, and I got to tell you something. I've prayed that prayer before. Lord, here's my situation. If you can do anything to help us out. <laughs> can he? Of course he can. I love Jesus' response. He responds just, just exactly appropriately. Jesus says, well, if you can believe then all things are possible. The guy is saying, if you can do anything, Jesus is saying, I can do anything if you believe. Right? If you believe, what's possible? Anything, man. Anything. I love that. So... Believing, then, is an important part of receiving from God the blessing that you seek. Correct? Now, let's take a look at verse 24. In verse 24, the dad says, well, it says, Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And I don't know about you, but I've prayed that very prayer. I have, I, I've confessed to you before, and I'm just going to remind because it makes per perfect sense to fit in here. After I became a pastor for a long season, I really, really struggled in my personal prayer life. My faith about receiving from God requests that I personally asked, it, it wasn't strong. Now, I could pray for you with great faith and believe that God would do anything. And I could believe that God would answer your prayers. But if I prayed for me personally, I was just really struggling to believe that I could receive. So I would ask my wife to pray for me. Not just because I wanted her to pray for me, but because I knew that God answered her prayers and I wasn't so sure he would answer a prayer about me from me. But he would answer one from, about me from her. <laughs> so my faith was all kind of mixed up, right? Well, I eventually came to the place where I was saying, Lord, I, I believe. I mean, I know you're a prayer hearing, prayer answering God. I believe you can do anything in the lives of people. Please help my unbelief where it comes to you answering my personal prayers about me. But sometimes we need to pray that prayer. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. All right, now in verse 29, verse 29, it says, so he said to them, this is after they said, hey, why couldn't we do it? I mean, we've been doing other things and how come we couldn't set this kid free? Um, and it says, so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and what? 
fasting. Prayer and fasting. When he said this kind, what is he referring to? Yeah, the demon, right? This kind of demon only comes out by nothing else but prayer and fasting, right? Which indicates two things. Number one, Jesus had been praying and fasting, right? He is our example in how many things? All things. Now, some of us, some of us pray regularly. Some of us pray erratically. Some of us pray with faith. Some of us pray questioning what we're praying about. But the idea is that generally there's prayer going on. While I'm speaking about prayer, I want to point out that there are three basic types of prayer. The first one is God-centered, where you recognize attributes of God. You know, Father, I just want to acknowledge that you are sovereign on your throne, that you're the creator of all things, that you have all wisdom and power, and all glory and honor belongs to you. You, you're, you know everything. You know the end from the beginning, and, and you talk to God about who he is and the wonder of his majesty. That's praise. By the way, God inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. Amen. I love the fact that my wife has an alarm on her phone that goes off three, day, three times a day. And I'm usually with her. And it'll go off and she'll go, oh, it's time to praise God. And so we stop right there. And we begin to praise God for who he is. Amen. Next. The, other, the next, second type of prayer is intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is where you are praying on behalf of someone else. You're asking that God will move in someone's life to heal, to deliver, to teach, to guide, to, right? To restore. That's intercessory prayer. And the third type of prayer is petition. This is where we pray to God regarding our own selves. Lord, I need from you wisdom today. What's in front of me, this, this decision is too confounding for me, but I know that you see clearly through it. I Please grant me wisdom so I make a good choice today. You know what I'm saying? These three types of prayer need to all be engaged in. And I assure you, Jesus himself did pray these three types of prayer. You can see them all in Scripture. And by the way, if you're going to be an effective prayer for someone else, by the way, the Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Meaning what? Simple way to put it. It changes things. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Changes things. When we think about righteousness, yeah, that's, that's the caveat, right? Of a righteous man. But your righteousness is in Jesus Christ, right? So when you think of your righteousness being in Christ, that's spotless, blameless. And so when you pray in the name of Jesus, believing and praying fervently, you need to expect that your prayer will avail much. So, if you want to have effective intercessory prayer, I want you to recognize that it will be flowing out of the fact that you have been engaged in the other types of prayer as well. You will have acknowledged who God is and your great dependence upon Him. And you will have asked Him to work in your heart and in your mind that He might impart to you the Holy Spirit and make you a vessel through which He can work. And then you engage in intercessory prayer. Is this clear? So, 
It is by prayer and fasting that this kind come out. And man, in those days, in those days, it seemed like people got, people got uh, afflicted with bad spirits, demons and stuff. Whew, I'm so glad that doesn't happen today, huh? You better believe it happens. If you don't think it happens, you are in the worst kind of a denial because you are not acknowledging that there is an enemy of your soul and your family. I assure you, there are dark forces at work, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen? So, by prayer and fasting is how this kind come out. Fasting means what? Not eating? Okay. Not eating. When Jesus fasted, he didn't eat, did he? Right? Okay. Here's the thing, though. Fasting is more than just about abstinence from food. I agree with you. It includes that. But it is... You, you then... Let's say that you take a period of time and you fast. You fast for a meal. Or you fast for a day. Or you fast for a week. Whatever the time period is. When you're fasting, when you are not eating, in the time when you would normally be eating, invest that time into taking in spiritual food. Amen. When you're not eating physically, eat spiritually. Open your heart to God. Talk with Him. Seek the Lord with your whole heart. This is the way that fasting will be advantageous. In that time when your mind is not clouded by the foods that you've consumed. And by the way, today, these days, there are so many foods that do consume, our, that we consume that cloud our minds. Especially things that are high in fat and sugar, which is like half of our diet. You know, I say that a little bit uh, tongue in cheek, but you get the meaning. These things cloud our minds. And when your mind is clouded, friends, when your mind is clouded, it is more difficult for the Holy Spirit to communicate with you and impart light to you. But when your mind is unclouded, then you can be enlightened in a more effective and timely manner. God will use the period of fasting to then equip you with the knowledge and the strength that you need as you engage in spiritual warfare on behalf of others. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? This stuff is important today. All right, so I also want to point one more thing out that I would be remiss to point out if, to, to leave out rather. If you notice, this boy, this young man maybe, who's been afflicted with a demon from childhood, a demon who physically abuses him and tries to destroy him and panics his father routinely. The problem with why he hasn't received the blessing of healing and deliverance in his life, what is the problem? What's blocking the flow of the blessing? Come on, from the passage, what's blocking the flow of the blessing? Unbelief. unbelief. Who's unbelief? The dad's unbelief. Wow. So you mean that my lack of faith can directly result in afflictions in my children's lives? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a deep, powerful, profound thought, isn't it? Unbelief blocks the flow 
of God's blessing into our lives. Let's take a look at the next, next passage found in James chapter 1. I know we're dealing with some familiar passages, but familiar passages are good because we need to pull out from them the application of their meaning. Right? James chapter 1, if you're there, say amen. All right, I'm going to begin reading in verse 5 and read through verse 8. If any of you, who? Any. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all, how? Liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I'm going to pause right there. What does it mean, liberally? Generous, yeah. Freely. I'm not tight-fisted. Giving it freely, right? Liberally. Take much. No limit. Amen. Okay. So if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Which man won't receive anything? The doubting one. That's right. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So what is the Bible saying that I can get from God? That's right. There is a caveat. I have to go to him how? Pardon me? Unwaveringly. I need to believe. I can't be doubting. You ever pray a prayer? Yeah, expectant is very good. Who put that chair there? <laughs> you ever pray a prayer that's like almost like if God could hear you speak every thought you have? Hmm, do you think he can? It would sound kind of like, well, you probably don't want to, God, but if it was possible, if, if maybe you would... I, you know what I mean? What if, what if we were coming to God with the kind of faith that God is worthy of? What kind of faith is He worthy of? Man, he's worthy of the kind of faith that would compel a young teenager to go out on the battlefield and stand up against a giant seasoned warrior and say, who are you to come to me against the God of Israel, right? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Doesn't he know our God? What if we came to God in the faith that he is worthy of when we pray. Then you would start seeing the truth of the scriptural principle that the, effective, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So, no doubting. Now let's go to Hebrews, right in front of James. Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. We're going to read verse 6. Okay, if you're there, say amen. All right. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is what? Impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when you come to God and you really believe that he is God, when I say God, I mean almighty sovereign on his throne, knows everything, has all wisdom, all power, all glory, all honor, all resources, is able to intervene in every affair and situation of man, still works miracles. He is God. Amen? It's impossible to please him if we don't come to him in that attitude. We must believe that he really is God and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not that he's tight-fisted, that he's holding back. You know, even in the parable of the persistent friend where the friend keeps knocking at the door, hey, you know, I got some company. I know it's late. You and the kids are in bed, but hey, we need some bread, right? And eventually the friend 
concedes and gives some bread so that they can feed their guests, right? The Bible says, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Oh, my friends, what I believe, what I believe is that over years of my life, my unbelief has blocked the flow of God's blessing into my life. And I also fear, uh, that's not the good way to put it. I also regret that as a result of my unbelief, God has well, not God. I have blocked the flow of God's blessing into the life of my wife and children. I'm taking this very seriously, very personally. And I want to have the kind of faith that God wants me to have. That He is worthy of me having. And I want to become the kind of man of prayer that... When I pray, because of who God is and His promises revealed in and through me, people around me expect things to happen. You know what I'm saying? Now we're going to go into another narrative. Actually, I'll be... I'll be Conscientious. I'm going to take a vote right now. Do you want to look at one more narrative and one more situation? Or do you want to call it a day and pick this up an another week? Who'd like to stay and study? Show your hands. All right. We're going to do that. Sorry. I could tell easily that was the majority. <laughs> All right. So we're going to look at this story, and I'll try not to go labor on too long, but it's important. It's, it's 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. If you're there, say amen. Still hear those pages rustling? All right. I've heard quite a few amens. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to begin at verse 1. We're going to read the entire text of chapter 15. Then we'll go back and talk about it, break it down a little bit like we did the previous story. Okay? Beginning in verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. He has ambushed, he, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey, I mean, this is total eradication, isn't it? Okay, picking up in verse 4. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tel Telaim. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. That's a pretty big army, right? And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart. Get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, 
I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel arose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep I hear in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? If you killed everything, why do I hear the sound of livestock? Right? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. I mean, immediately he's given excuse. They only kept the best and they kept them to make sacrifices to your God. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, what does that mean? Little in your own eyes. Right, didn't think much of yourself. Humble, that's right. Were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And go on on the mission on which the Lord sent me. And brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So he's passing the buck, isn't he? Blaming it on the people. So Samuel said, Has the Lord... Excuse me. Has the Lord us great delight, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as, of the, as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you. From being king. And then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. It's better to obey God than man, right? Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Who's that neighbor? David, yeah. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. He still wants to save face, doesn't he? So Samuel turned back after Saul. And Saul worshiped the Lord. You know, the Lord is merciful. Amen. Then Samuel said, Bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, 
As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gabeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Whew, that's quite a story, isn't it? That is quite a story. I want to consider a few things from that story. In verse 12, it says that Saul set up a monument for himself. Then down uh, later, it says that uh, when he was little in his own eyes, right? But uh, obviously, he's not little in his own eyes. He's setting up a monument for himself. And you know what? People can even do this in the name of the Lord. Do you know that? Sometimes people build a church even. They build a church and it's supposed to be a, a, a monument to the Lord, but it's really a, a monument to the donor. Anyway, Saul was big in his own eyes. In verse 13, he said, I have performed the commandment. That's how he greeted him. <laughs> I, he come out to Samuel saying, I've performed the commandment. Did he perform the commandment? No. Actually, he wiped out all, all the people. He only left the king alive, didn't he? That wasn't the commandment. The commandment was to lay waste to everything. Isn't that right? Eradicate it all. And by the way, there's something that is applicable for you and I. Do you know, and I'm just going to use a simple lesson here. It's it, one that's easy to pick on. It's, it, I'm going to pick on it because it's easy to pick on and explain, but it's also applicable for us. Um, here's a little side note that you ought to be informed of. From 2017 to 2018, the tithe in this church went down by 20%. From this month in 2018 to this month in 2019, it's taken another dip of 8%. So, the thing is, I'm going to pick on tithe for a minute. Okay? So, let's say that it's time to remit tithe and offering, and I put in a token $20 into the plate. I might kind of rationalize that I have performed the commandment because I went through the motion of giving at church. But am I really feeling what God has called me to do? Because what He requires from me is a 10% tithe and offerings. Is it right? Please don't get me wrong. I am not getting hung up on legalism. What I am doing is addressing obedience. You can do this with anything, man. I just picked on tithe because it's easy to explain and point out. And it does apply to our congregation. So, having said that, the Bible says about the commandments if we offend in part we offend in all his claim was I've performed the commandment and he did in part but he didn't in all and the way God saw it is he was disobedient and rebellious okay Verse 16 says, be quiet. Friends, do you know that there comes a time when you need to stop making excuses for your behavior? 
when you need to stop rationalizing what your misconduct is about and let God speak to you words of correction, words of peru reproof. Let Him get you on the right track. But you have to be quiet to hear Him. Amen? Yes. By the way, pastor's not being hardcore today. I just think the Word of God is pretty straight. Right. Amen? All right. Next thing, verse 17. When you were little in your own eyes, and it's been pointed out, being little in your own eyes is to be humble before the Lord, to recognize that it's Him who's great. You know, He's God and I am not, right? By the way, should I point out that all or nothing principle again? He's either Lord of all or He's not Lord at all in your life. Okay, so um, when you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, what does He promise? He will lift you up. He will exalt you. The opposite of that is when I raise myself up, when I exalt myself, pride goes before a fall. He'll bring me low. Okay. Verse 22 says, To obey is better than sacrifice. I want you to think about this. When you think about the old um, way of worship, their system of doing things. Sacrifice was pivotal in how man approached God, right? It, when they brought sacrifice, they were acknowledging, you are God. You are worthy of being worshipped. I am bringing a sacrifice out of obedience to you, and I am laying it down in faith, putting my trust in you, that you will allow a blessing to flow through my worship of you. Right? God is saying to obey is better than sacrifice. If, if you want to demonstrate that you acknowledge me as God, if you want to demonstrate that you have faith in me and in my goodness, if, if you want to demonstrate that you belong to me as my covenant people, then obey me. It's better than sacrifice or any other form of worship. In verse 23, it says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft? My goodness, when I think about witchcraft, I think about like, you know, dark, evil, absolutely opposite of God stuff, don't you? And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft? Like dark and evil and absolutely opposite of God? Yep. Amen. Yep. He said it, and I believe it. Amen? We're going to look at three passages from Psalms and close for today. What we're going to look at right now is Psalm 103. Psalm 103, we're going to read verses 17 and 18. All right, if you're there, would you say amen? amen? Very good. Beginning reading then in verse 17. Check this out. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who do what? Fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. I want to pause right here to point out that what was blocking the blessing of the young man, remember, was his dad's unbelief. Right? From the first story, folks? You connecting with me? Now it's saying, if you will fear the Lord, you can bless your children's children. Because of the blessing God pours out on you. Notice what it goes on to say. And such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. God blesses those who keep his covenant. And can the church say amen? amen. 
Amen. Now, let's take a look at Psalm 119, verses 1 through 4. This is at least as pointed. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 4. So picking up in verse 1, what is the very first word there? Blessed. Blessed are who? Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. Testimonies is another way of saying what? Commands. That's right. Who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts. How? Diligently. diligently. What does diligently mean? What? Diligent. Yeah. Diligent does mean diligent. <laughs> what else does it mean? Okay. Yeah. You're very intentional. What? Carefully. Carefully. Thoroughly. You're, you're giving good attention to this, right? Okay. So you be walking in the Lord's laws diligently. Blessing is tied to that. So we're looking back on these, these two stories. In the story of Saul, what is the blocker of the flow of blessing? What's, what's blocking it? Unbelief. Along with? Ding, ding, ding. Disobedience and rebellion are the key issues in this story. They do indicate unbelief. Okay? So to open up... To open up the flow of blessing, we're instructed by these last passages in Psalms to obey. Amen. How do you open up the clogged hose that, through which the blessings flow that are clogged by disobedience? You obey. The it's better than liquid plumber. Right. Open right up. Then... From the previous story, the story of the young man, the, the boy who was possessed with the demon, who was tormenting him, trying to destroy him, the dad's issue was what? Unbelief. Unbelief. And we saw that without faith, it is impossible to please him. So how do you open up the flow of blessing? Well... If you go to God, you have to believe that He is God. And that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Go to Him with no doubting. Know that He can and He will and He does answer prayers. That He loves you with an everlasting love and He would withhold no good thing from you. Right? Finally, we will close with this verse. Psalm 37 and verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. I'm going to tell you something right now. If you will delight yourself in the Lord, if you make him the apple of your eye, if you will embrace his covenant and make him the, the pearl of great price in your eye, he will work in your heart to change your heart so that your desires are made new and in harmony with his will and he will give you the desires of your heart. The word of the Lord has been spoken in your hearing today. Amen. Let us sing about this very thing, the two issues that have been addressed today. Trust.